Telecameras three and four working. Activate radio contact with the outside. Love, wisdom, abundant life. Live a life filled with meaning, purpose, and a sense of accomplishment. Can you hear me? Welcome to the teachings of Enoch. I'm your host, James Allen. Listen every week at this time on KKVV AM 1060 Las Vegas. You can listen online at KKVV.com, on your smartphone using the TuneIn radio app, or listen anytime at teachingsofenoch.com. You can contact me by sending a text message to 702-483-7769. That's 702-483-7769. Or online at teachingsofenoch.com. Let's get started with today's message. My special guest today is Mary Frances Boley, author of The White Umbrella, published by Moody Publishers. Mary is the founder and president of Wellspring Living, an organization fighting childhood sexual abuse and exploitation in Peachtree City, Georgia. Thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy schedule, Mary, to be on the show today. Well, thank you. I'm glad to do it. Mary, talk to me about the vision you had for Wellspring Living. I mean, you're working with some women that really have gone through some horrific things in their past. How did you get this vision, and 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 what what made you go ahead with this? Well, I think that it's real important to note that I did not have a vision at the beginning. Uh, it was a group of women that just cared about disenfranchised and marginalized young women ages eighteen and up back in two thousand one, over twelve years ago. And what occurred is that we had been working together on a large event, and then from that point forward really felt the need to connect women who were with totally without hope with those in the church who had hope. And uh, in the process of connecting with nonprofits that were serving marginalized women, women who were trying to put on us in very desperate and disastrous situations, uh, we, we came across an organization that needed help in developing a residential program. And so we reached out to help in that way, and that's how it all began. Um, we began to provide residential services in a very uh, structured way with uh, therapy uh, for them and training in life skills and helping them to be physically well. In fact, it, you can call it a comprehensive or holistic approach for looking at their body, mind, and spirit becoming whole and being healed from the wounds that they had experienced within the first um year, we realized that it didn't really matter what their presenting issue, there was a, a, a core issue that was driving maybe the addiction or the self-mutilation or the eating disorder or the depression, and that was childhood sexual abuse. And the statistic is that one in four young women by the age of 18 have suffered childhood sexual abuse, one in four. And with that statistic that's validated by the Center for Disease Control, we know that those are only reported cases, and over 80% of, of cases of childhood sexual abuse is among family and friends. And so mm. it's a, a probably more prevalent than we um, can statistically even uh, validate, but recognizing that that causes such a trauma in the brain that, and such a, a scar on the brain that it's, a, it's very difficult for someone to just totally act normal and respond normally to situations that actually represses them and arrest their development emotionally um, at the age of the occurrence. And so working in that for several years, seeing tremendous success, and um, our mayor of the city of Atlanta came to me at one point and said, I know what you're doing for young women, and we have young girls who have been bought and sold on, uh, in Atlanta, and we need your help. And so from that point forward, um, we began to look at ways that we could serve young girls ages 12 to 17 who were victims of childhood sexual exploitation. Now, Mary Francis, that's an incredible statistic. Reported one in four women are sexually abused as as children. That's just an incredible number. I mean, I have two daughters myself, and... Uh, <laughs> 
and I just look at their friends and I'm in just doing the math, there's going to be a large percentage of, of them that have had some kind of sexual abuse of, of some it's, sort in their past. That's incredible. It really is. And just now, I think we're beginning to recognize this is a, a very prevalent problem. I, I'm actually holding in my hand, my husband gave me this, the uh, December issue of uh, Sports Illustrated that lists that R.A. Dickey and Kayla Harrelson um, you know, athletes that have come out and said, this is what happened to me. And so re- in reality, um, it is out there and it, it has no, um, I mean, you would think, well, it's only the people that are, are in poverty and it really is not have any socioeconomic uh, uh, indicators, nor does it have cultural indicators. So we're talking about people that um, come from all all walks of society that it happens among their in their family so it's, it's very prevalent and what that does is it makes a girl vulnerable and toward even more exploitation and now we're seeing even more severe situations when you're talking about a young girl um, that can enter into the issue of trafficking at the age of 12 that's the age that many of the young girls are lured into this and um, so it's a very serious situation that we need to take note of I, you know, in your book, you mentioned a situation where a girl is, you know, supposedly talking to a friend and then she's, she's kidnapped and, and taken away and abused and everything. And, and this is happening here in our country. Uh, of course, our show is originating from Las Vegas and, you know, it's known as Sin City and there's been a big issue before the legislator. And I don't know if they're going to adopt the, the laws or not about the sex trafficking. It's a huge problem. Um, and it's just incredible to me that in the United States, this kind of thing is going on. We think it's going to happen, you know, in some of these third world countries. But Mary Frances, you point out it's happening right here in our country. It really is. We know that 100 girls a night in Atlanta are exploited. We know that 100,000 children in the United States are exploited. And we're not talking about international children. We're talking about American girls. American children who are being bought and sold for someone else's pleasure. And I think the thing that's very difficult for us to wrap our hands around is the fact that this is not about some man that's mad and so he's going to do something violent. It's really uh, a business. And they look at our children as products that will make them money. And so they're not even looked at, at by the people who are exploiting them as a person. And they're just someone that they'll use to discard. And so that is the reason why it is so important that we get involved because who's going to stand and have a voice for these children who have no voice? Who's going to protect them? And I believe that we as people of faith have to do that. We have to step out of our comfort zone. We have to do whatever we can. And that's why we wrote the book, The White Umbrella, because we believe that it is the the people of faith that are going to make a difference in this issue. It can't just be government. It can't just be nonprofit. We need literally thousands and thousands of people who will take whatever gifting and whatever resources they have and figuratively open their white umbrella over an organization or over a young girl. Because we use the term a white umbrella because it's a wonderful symbol. These girls need protection from a horrific storm. And, you know, we pull out our umbrella when there's a bad storm and we hold it over us, and we need to be in close proximity with the person that's walking in the rain with us in order for that person that needs us to hold that umbrella over them to be protected. And we use the color white because innocence restored. Before these girls had a chance to choose what their life would be, someone has stolen it from them. And we believe that God is a God of redemption and restoration, and he can take what is horrific and turn it into something beautiful. You know, Mary, uh, some of these girls, no doubt, went, by the time you counsel them and they get involved with your center there, the the uh, the Wellspring Living Center there, um, how how do you go through the process really of rebuilding somebody's life that has gone through? Uh, you know, there's all different types of uh, of sexual abuse, but some of these things that we've discussed that are, you know, the the sexual exploitation and those kinds of things, the kidnapping. I mean, how do you go through that process of even beginning to rebuild someone's life like that? 
Well, I think you have to do the same thing that God has done for us. And the first thing God did for us is he loved us before we knew him. He loved us before we had the ability to love him. And so with every girl that comes into our program, we, um, we love her. We accept her where she is. And we recognize that she's been through something horrible. One of the reasons we wrote the book is because we wanted you to understand that these are just little girls. They're not somebody that decided to go make money uh, for a new pair of jeans. These are girls who have been lured and trapped. And um, so once you understand that, you have a better capacity to love them. And you have to love them without expectation. Um, And I think that's a huge um, step that all of us have to learn how to do in any time that we're working with someone that's in a crisis situation. And so loving them and then as we show love, not by the words that we say so much, but by our actions, we can build trust. We believe in relationship recovery. That means that we are going to care for you just where you are and try to prove to you that we're trustworthy because we know that the people that you've trusted in the past have not been trustworthy. Why should you trust us? So we have to prove it. It takes time, and so it's a a slow process. But in the same way that God has um, built uh, and has redeemed us and we have been recovered from our sin, through the relationship with Jesus, then we as ambassadors for Christ have to do that with others. And so it's that relationship building that brings them to a point where they can trust us and then begin to accept the healing processes that have to be in place for the girls. And so it looks very different for each girl. You have to look at them as an individual. We do have best practices, evidence-based practices for our therapy. And then the other thing that is a key component is the education piece. We do a personalized education, which that helps the girl see that they can, she can be successful. It builds trust, again, that we're there to help her, and that it actually is a key component in the girl staying in the program is having the good education. Well, I like the fact that it's not just talk, Mary Francis, because I'm sure these gals have heard it all, you know, all the lies they can stand anymore, and really it's where the rubber meets the road, and putting that faith into action. And I I like what you said, Mary Francis, it's about building that trust through relationship and showing them that, yes, we do care. We're not just talking the talk, we're we're walking the walk. Um, And and for me, it's, you know, Christianity and our faith is real or, or we're just playing a game. And that's why I was so impressed with your your book and your ministry there, that you're out there on the front lines uh, really making an impact with these young girls' lives, and that's that's very, very powerful. Well, thank you so much for sharing our story, and our goal is that we would just be able to share this with other groups that are wanting to build capacity because we know that there's a great need for more places for young girls to be restored. And so... If people are interested, uh, first of all, I recommend they read the book, and then secondly, get in touch with us, and let's see how we can build places of safety and love for girls all over our nation. Well, I think here, you know, in Las Vegas, there's a big problem as well, and that's why I, I really decided that this is an issue that I'd like to talk about, and I, I hope that people are listening today and um, get some inspiration from your center there. How many how many girls are are in your program? Let's say in a, in a given time period, Mary Francis, just so we have some kind of idea what sure. what you're doing there. Right. We can serve up to now 27 girls, okay. um, and then we also serve women. So at any given time, we're looking at 45 people from ages 12 to 40. Um, and then, of course, that's at one time, and our goal is to take this model and help other people, not necessarily put a wellspring in every city, but help the grassroots community build a place for young girls because, and quite frankly, it takes a community. It can't just be one organization. It takes the whole community coming together to make a difference in the life of the girls, which ultimately makes a life a difference in the life of that family. And truly, when you deal with the least of these in a community, you're changing the community. So we, we see this as a major uh, building block for community re- redevelopment and redefining um, what the church needs to be for the most vulnerable in our culture. 
Now, Wellspring Living, the way you are set up there, Mary Francis, is you have, uh, I guess, different components. You have maybe like uh, a safety area where women can go temporarily. Is that right? And as well as more long-term recovery. Is that is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so that I think that that's a great model because... Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, women just need to get out of a certain environment and kind of get their self together a little bit and, and, and maybe their own place and, and kind of move on. And then, of course, like you said, getting involved in the more severe cases, the exploitation, that kind of thing really requires that relationship um, and that trust building again. Now, you mentioned the, the education component. Um, how... How does that play into uh, building the the victim's trust or their self esteem back? Um, how maybe you can talk a little bit about that? How do you build? You know, you, you've got someone that's so broken inside. How can they see a way out of that dark hole? Well, I think one of the things that is important is that you build an environment that reflects that you care and that they are worth it. Um, and so one of the things that we have found very important is that the, the place where the girls are is made beautiful. And so if we renovate places and create uh, facilities for the girls, we have a color palette that's made up of restorative colors. It's beautiful. It's bright. It's encouraging. We have new furnishings in there. So the moment she walks in that place, she knows that someone thought about her before she walked through the doors. We have a moment. Uh, we have the first... 30 days is uh, an assessment orientation time where she's getting a lot of individual care. We're helping her discover her voice again because he has st- the, whoever the perpetrator is has stolen her voice. So all of those things are very, very um, important in building that self-esteem. And it is time. It, it really is just you proving and building trust over time that helps the world rebuild what um, has been stolen from her. Now, Mary Francis, for other people maybe who have a vision or uh, a, 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 a burden to go into this type of ministry and really put their faith on the line, how important is it to to get together with a good team and, and put your vision together and, and make sure it's successful? Well, it definitely is. It's very, very hard work, and and you do face a lot of obstacles, as I shared in the book. So it's important that we work together. And so um, I suggest anyone that's interested that they look in their community and see who's doing what and see if you can join them. If that's not possible, then you pray. No matter what, I think reading the book helps because it is a handbook. We we tell the story of a girl. We we help you understand that they're just little girls. And then we give you the medical background, like factual information that helps you understand why a girl is vulnerable. And then we ch- share what recovery looks like because you need to know what you're getting involved in. And then the rest of the book really talks about how ordinary people can be involved. So it doesn't have to just be people who are involved with, that have a degree in therapy or social work or even in the medical profession any person can be involved at some level. And so understanding what's appropriate and what that looks like is important. So I think the book is a huge um, value add for someone that's wanting to make a difference in the issue of sex trafficking. Now, if you're just tuning in to us, my guest today on the program, Mary Frances Boley, author of The White Umbrella, and it's published by Moody Publishers. And Mary is the founder and president of Wellspring Living. Now, Mary, um, we've talked about so many great things uh, and topics here on the program. Um, the When you started and you put this vision in place and you started working with community leaders, you mentioned it can be very time-consuming, difficult. Was was there support from the from the community? Was there opposition because they, they didn't understand what you were doing? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Mary Francis. Sure. You know, I was really amazed at the great support. I, I've believed for years, we've seen it over the last 12 years, that if you bring a need to people, people want to help but you have to make it um, accessible to them and you have to make it very clear how they can help. And so if you get involved, those are two things I think you need to be very 
aware of. You need to be clear in your message. You need to make it accessible. And you need to make it in a way that's protecting them and your and the girls that you serve. And so as we began to share the need, we were shocked at how people would give money toward the renovation. They would actually take their time, their Saturday, and come to work all day long to clean up a place, to paint, to do whatever was is needed. We're working on a facility right now, and people are going to be coming in building and uh, building and cleaning and uh, planting flowers and digging areas to create an organic garden. There are so many ways the community can be involved, but it's a matter of making that communication clear and accessible. So I think we were blown out of the water with how, um, especially when we did the first uh, cottage that we were working on, we had probably over 300 people out there just totally changing the landscape oh, that's and incredible. the atmosphere of that building because we made it we made known the need and people want to help and so I, I just think there's something good in us that rises up when we think about a child being trafficked a child being exploited no one believes it should happen it's the one thing we can all agree on so give people a way to serve and they will do it is there for the the these young girls that are victims of this uh, these, this trafficking and this exploitation, and when they when you encounter them and and they're they're brought into your program to start afresh, what are some of the stages that you take them through? We we've talked about course building the the relationship, building that trust, um, education. What are some the the stages that maybe they go through on a personal level that you've seen now everyone of course is different but maybe you can talk about that as far as what the 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 victim and she's trying to rebuild that life back what what how does she go through that process right well we have a section in the book that talks about the stages of change and that's basically it's a it's a therapeutic uh, process of understanding that people come in and sometimes you don't even realize you need help i mean even those who deal with addiction, and even us. I mean, we have blind spots in our life. We don't realize we need help. And so it's that part of um, bringing that person to a point of recognition of their need. And then as each uh, stage of change happens, you realize it's circular. You may uh, realize that you need help, but then you step backwards and maybe um, you're, you're not ready for that truth. Many times, girls and women who recognize that they have been exploited, that it wasn't necessarily their fault. It's one of the most vulnerable times in that healing process. And so as you uh, think about, uh, there are several the stages of change that was um, begun and talked about in the book, talk about the pre-contemplation, like, okay, I realize I have a problem. And then you think about it. You realize that I need to get out of this situation. And then now the preparation is I, I must make a change and what are my alternatives? And then finally the action is I'm going to take steps to address this problem. And it's all done with a therapeutic mindset. So you've got a therapist that is working alongside the girls. You have people that are what sometimes called direct care. We call them coaches that are in the game with the, with the girls every day, walking beside them, encouraging them, speaking truth giving them, uh, helping them to see their strengths to walk out of the situation. And even when they've begun to make those steps forward, there's a period of maintenance where she's feeling successful. We also know that relapse is a part of recovery, and sometimes you'll be walking, the girl will be walking through her recovery, and something will trigger her, and she may take a step backwards. But that's the reason why it's important that you understand this a process and that you stay with that girl and she knows that no matter what you're going to be there for her and that's what relationship recovery is about when even when the girls leave our program they're always calling us back and letting us know how they're doing or even letting us know if they're not doing well and they need to know that you care enough about them to share and accept them when they're doing well and even when they're not doing well we look at success as their their uh, belief that they can call us that they know that we're going to care for them no matter what. That's a that's a measure of success with girls who've been so traumatized. Beautiful. My very special guest today, Mary Frances Boley, author of The White Umbrella, published by Moody Publishers. Mary is the founder and president of Wellspring Living. 
a great organization fighting childhood sexual abuse and exploitation in Peachtree City, Georgia. Mary Frances, thank you very much for putting your faith into action, making an impact in our world today, and it's been a pleasure having you on the program today. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing the story, and we will look forward to hearing back from some people in Las Vegas. What's going on? What are they stopping for? Love, wisdom, abundant life. That's my hope for you. You've been listening to The Teachings of Enoch. I'm James Allen, your host. You can contact me by sending a text message to 702-483-7769. That's 702-483-7769. Or online at teachingsofenoch.com. You can listen to this program every week at the same time on KKVV AM 1060, Las Vegas. You can listen online at KKVV.com on your smartphone using the TuneIn radio app or listen anytime at teachingsofenoch.com.